Well, it's 5.30 in the morning in uh, Albert Lee, Minnesota. There's my car from over there. Nobody stole it? Cool. So now one thing I did, uh, uh, oh, by the way, yesterday I found time. I cleaned up those uh, scratches because I went to the local uh, uh, Home Depot. And I found the last piece of the puzzle. I needed a super fine uh, sandpaper. I already had uh, 3,000 and I needed something like 5,000, but they didn't have anything, anything, but there was a 3M super fine uh, little, little kind of like a mini brick with their, with the sandpaper wrapped around it. So I used soap water, I used uh, the 3000 sandpaper and then this super fine sandpaper and then polish and wax and washing, washing everything with soap water in between. And now the gloss is back and scratches are pretty much gone. And then in the back on the bumper I have two deep scratches right where they try to break the lock. And it's plastic, so of course you can find a paint, right? One of but nobody has them in stock, you know, those little um the ones that match your paint. And so what I did, I bought a piece of uh it says carbon fiber, basically it looks like carbon fiber, like a black piece, something that they use to put like a stripe on your hood or you know on the car. And I cut it in half and made it like this long and I I stuck it on the bumper right where those scratches are because usually um, they have a thing called a bumper uh, pro guard protector and so people put them on the bumper just in, you know when you move your suitcases or something in and out of the trunk so you don't scratch the bumper and so it looks okay I think I'm, a, I'm off by like a couple of millimeters to one side but it covered the scratches and my car is gray and black, black wheels, you know, black stuff everywhere. So it looks good. And now the last thing I need to do is just to find that uh, piece of uh, rubber for the window. Um, I'll try to find it when I'm in Alberta. Anyway, so it's 5.30 in the morning and I'm doing a video for you guys. So you should appreciate that. So I've been thinking about um, the business of a freight broker. Uh, versus the business of an independent trucker and you know from the standpoint of uh, expenses and lifestyle and I came up with a list and on the broker side it has five entries basically what you need to be a broker and on the trucker side it has like 20 entries and so I thought it would be it would be interesting to compare what the trucker has to do in order to make money and what the broker has to do in order to make money to stay in business and from the top there's only three things as far as i know um, that both the trucker and the broker need well first off there's a, usually there's three parties right involved um there's the shipper the person that has the product to be shipped like a machine you know an excavator then there's a carrier that's looking for that load but quite often they cannot connect so the carrier the trucker and so they use intermediaries or freight brokers right and so freight broker let's say pays pays the shipper ten thousand but he charges the trucker twenty thousand and so no wait uh, <laughs> the opposite way he charges the shipper twenty thousand but he tells the trucker the load only pays ten thousand so he keeps ten thousand no of course that's just a that's just a bs example because typically brokers uh from what i know they make about anywhere between 10 and 15 or 20 percent right so if the load pays ten thousand the broker might make like a thousand fifteen hundred somewhere there, you know but depends again depends on your negotiating skills 
And that's one thing I'm good at. I'm good at negotiating because as a trucker, I always had to negotiate. And that's why I had to sit on my butt for like two, two, three weeks at a time trying to find a good load that pays a lot. Especially since I'm in Canada, right? I'm Canadian, so I have much, I had much fewer loads to choose from compared to American truckers that can do loads inside the US. Anyway, so here's the list. So both the trucker and the broker need, first off, MC authority or US DOT number. But the trucker needs a carrier MC authority and the broker needs broker MC authority, but it's the same thing. So th second, they need a subscription to load boards, usually, right? So unless you are somewhere like Western Canada, but where people don't believe in load boards, but most of the time you need load boards. And I had a subscription to two load boards. And so this is both the same for broker and trucker. And, um, and third, you need, of course, you need internet access and you need a phone, right? Which nowadays everybody has. And even if you don't have some kind of a fancy modem or high speed internet at your workplace, you can have use your phone as a hotspot, right? And that's what I did quite often. And that's where the similarities seem to end between the broker and independent trucker. So uh, the broker on top of these three, MC authority, internet and load boards, uh, the two other major expenses are the bond, but $75,000 bond, but you don't pay 75,000, you just it's kind of like insurance, right? So you pay a annual premium, which is about, from what I understand, anywhere between two and three thousand dollars a year. And you know, when I was a trucker, I was pretty much doing all my uh, billing and you know bills of lading and invoices. I was doing them manually, right? I didn't have a what they call TMC software, transportation management software. I mean TMS. Right, TMS, oh, TMC, I think it's TMS, TMS, yeah, transportation management software. So basically it's uh, usually it's, it's all online and it's like a database and it allows you to quickly create bills of lading and invoices and it uh, quite often will, um, will uh, uh, synchronize with the load board right like when you take a load from the load board boom right away so it's much easier to create bills of lading it's much faster and then if you already had this customer in the past you know that software will allow you to you know quickly find that customer and you can just duplicate the bills of lading and stuff like that just change the you know the load so it's it's a really good uh, when you have lots of loads right but as a carrier with one truck, one trailer, one driver, I was just doing everything by hand, right? I would just take the previous bill of lading, you know, change the number, bill of lading number, and then just change the shipper, uh, you know, the customer, the load description, print it out, and that's it. Because I only had one, two, three loads a month, and it worked for me fine, so I could avoid the cost because this software TMS software, it can be uh, probably a couple, couple of hundred bucks a month, two, three uh, hundred dollars a month. And then um, actually for the broker, the load boards are more expensive than for the trucker. Like I was paying 250 bucks Canadian for the Canadian load board and I was paying about $35 US for the US load board. But for the broker, it's, it's going to be more money because you deal with much more freight, right? And so the broker, yeah, so MC Authority, Bond, TMS, Internet Phone, and Load Board subscriptions, subscription, which are higher than the trucker. Now the trucker, let's open the long list. On top of these, the trucker has to deal with, and for some reason I put that at the top of the list, DOT inspections, right? Your workplace pretty much the truck, the trailer, is getting constantly inspected by people that wear firearms at work, basically police, 
Now, as a broker, you don't have to do that, right? Like you're sitting in your office or you can be anywhere. You can be in Florida during winter. You know, you can be in Bahamas or something, right? All you need is your computer and your phone. There's no people knocking on your door, you know, armed to the teeth with Glock 17. And, okay, Mr. Dretcher, we'd like to inspect your room over here, right? Whereas as a trucker, you constantly harassed by DOT inspectors and they will give you a ticket for smallest violation like a missing um, reflective tape on top of the muffler guess how I know right or um, like a, any any stupid thing on the truck and trailer if they're in the mood they will give you a ticket and so DOT inspections right which comes with DOT fines. So there's fines, there's points on your license as a carrier. A broker doesn't have to do that. So workplace workplace inspections. Um, omnipresent with carriers, non-existent with brokers. Then we have expensive repairs. And you know, as they say in Wall Street, never invest into something that eats or needs repairs so from that standpoint trucking business is a bad investment like you invest money in your truck that's okay maybe like first second year it doesn't break down but then it starts breaking down but actually there's always something I, re I remember even during my first year when I got my truck my Kenworth uh, T880 there was always something you know like you have a flat tire somebody hits you in the parking lot uh, even brand new truck there's always constant expenses you know upkeep maintenance oh oil changes right the broker doesn't have to do that inspection stickers right so you have to inspect your truck and trailer and in my case i had i had four trailers right i had the tr uh, tandem trailer 60 ton g and i had the uh, three flip axles so that's four trailers so i need four inspection stickers and number five for the truck right so you always have to keep in mind these when they expire so once i was in alberta and i forgot that my i forgot to update my uh, tracking uh, sticker the annual inspection the guy gave me a fine made me drop the trailer i was lucky i found a, uh, an inspection shop in a nearby license inspection shop in a nearby uh, town and so that's another form of how DOT inspectors will, will kind of like harass you, right? Truck stop food, right? As a broker, you don't need to eat at truck stops, but as a, as a trucker, you often don't have a choice. So you stuck with these, you know, um, choke and puke places, you know, uh, which is not good for your health. Uh, medical exams. As a trucker, you have to have a subscription. Uh, I think in my case it was anywhere between thirty and hundred dollars a month, depending on how many uh, random checks they had. But basically, you have to be a part of this, um, you know, drug and alcohol test program, right? Where they once in a while they will send you an invoice. I mean, invoice. Uh, they will send you a letter saying that you know uh, you've been pre-selected for random testing. But in my case, it was actually easy because I'm only one guy. Right, whereas before, when I was an owner operator working for a company with maybe 10, 15 drivers, they selected me like, I don't know, every month. Every month I would get a call from their boss saying, okay, Sergey, you gotta go to the, for the drug inspection or, or alcohol inspection. Like, does the broker have to do this? No, you can be drunk all day long, as long as you can type on your keyboard and you can answer the phone without slurring too many words, you can be a broker. So it's much more strict for carriers, is what I'm trying to say. So alcohol drug test. Now, high payments. No, so as a broker, you do have payments, right? But you can use your old computer. Like I have my Mac. Yeah, it was expensive, but you need a computer. You need a phone subscription, TMS, right? So, okay, it's maybe $1,000, $2,000 a month, okay? If you're, if you're lucky. But as a trucker, especially if you like owning new equipment, uh, again, I'm talking about 
we're talking not about a company driver own operator we're comparing an independent trucker with an independent broker right like basically basic comparison because I'm not a broker yet so those five expenses I give you authority bond TMS internet load boards are just what I know so far but again I'm learning and so I'll post more channels more videos on this channel as I'm learning more about this but as a broker you don't have high equipment lease payments right so my truck and trailer were very expensive of course when I started it was cheap but then you always try to update your equipment you know make it better so you can hold more loads you know make more money and then you end up with very high payments and it's very stressful speaking about stress uh, as a trucker especially as a heavy haul trucker you often drive in highly populated areas with oversized loads right where you constantly have to watch for people you know trying to hit you or cut you off and so it can be very stressful you know when you're driving a 105 or 107 110 foot long rig let's say 12 feet wide and you are you are tall you know uh, like you go through something like chicago or something you know it's not you cannot just drive like this like you like you saw me on the other video i was driving in my car through chicago you cannot do that you know so there's a lot of stress involved of course as a, as a broker yeah you have stress as well uh, but you can offset that with i don't know you can you can have a couple of kettlebells at your workplace you know like it's very stressful you feel like killing somebody just go throw some kettlebells you know go for a walk uh, you're not restricted, you're not tied up, you're not anchored to one place, a truck, right? Where you cannot just stop the truck on the road and go for a walk in the park, right? Uh, insurance. So the broker only has to pay the bond insurance, whereas the trucker has to have insurance uh, for the truck, trailer, and also for Canadians. For me, in order, in order for me to enter U.S., I needed personal or disability insurance, health insurance. Um, it's not like a federal requirement, but it depends on carry on uh, brokers. And I remember when I was signing up with the Landstar as an approved carrier, so I can hold their loads, and they were setting me up in their system. One of the requirements was proof of health insurance because I was Canadian. So in case something happens. In US, uh, they know that I'm protected, and I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna call the broker and ask for money, you know, to pay my hospital bill, right? And so, that's that medical insurance. I think I was paying like 200 bucks or something Canadian a month. So, you don't need that as a broker, right? Now, accidents, right? It's it's hard to hit somebody on the highway when you're a broker sitting behind your computer, right? You drive your car maybe to visit some customers and stuff like that, but it's a car. Uh, it's accidents are much, much more prone to happen when you have an oversized load. And again, you're driving in a populated areas with lots of traffic and people don't know how to drive. And so when something like that happens, or even like people hit you, right? People hit you in the parking lot. So it's an extra cost. Again, it's extra stress. Uh, plates. As a trucker, especially as a Canadian independent carrier, you need international IRP, International Registration Plan plates. You need plates on your truck that allow you to go into US and into any jurisdiction in Canada. And those are pretty expensive. Mine were about 3,000 Canadian a year. And I had to update them every September. Uh, then, of course, you need IFTA international fuel tax agreement because whenever your wheels are rolling uh, the governments of all these jurisdictions pretty much want their cut for every mile you run in the form of a fuel tax so it's not much like every quarter i would pay i don't know anywhere between 20 and 100 bucks canadian every three months but you have to prepare if returns it uh, 
at first it took me like a day to pre prepare that iftar return because I was doing them myself. And then at the end, I think it started taking me, I don't know, a couple of hours. But still, you, you have to waste a couple of hours of your life just doing these stupid returns with like thousands of numbers involved and thousands of calculations. And then at the end, it's like either I owe them like $25. And I was joking about this in my previous videos. I said, I would gladly pay them 100 bucks, you know, just make it like an easy way to file IFTA taxes, just put in a $100 bill in the envelope, say, okay, IFTA return for this. But no, they want to know your mileage. They want to know uh, for each jurisdiction, they want to know how much fuel you purchased in each jurisdiction. It's crazy, you know, I hated that IFTA. So now if, <laughs> if when I become a broker, no more IFTA, man. And then of course fuel, right? <laughs> Especially now with the prices of fuel, well, now they seem to be going down, but it's just crazy, you know, how much, how much fuel you, you, you waste. And that's probably the biggest, like, repairs, no, uh, payments. Equipment payments are the highest bill I had to pay. And then second was uh, repairs. No, second was fuel. So bills for, you know, the equipment, then, then fuel, and then repairs. And, um, and yeah, and of course, let's say as a broker, you just drive a regular car. You don't need a semi truck with 605 horsepower. And so my truck was doing maybe like six miles a gallon with a light load, you know, like three and a half miles a gallon, uh, with a heavy load, two miles a gallon in winter with a heavy load and maybe seven miles a gallon if I'm empty, whereas in a car, um, like yesterday I was driving, I was doing 10 liters per hundred kilometers, which I think is like 25, 27 miles a gallon. No, maybe, maybe 22, 23. Um, and then as a, as a carrier, one more thing, I think it's like the last one I wrote down here is, um, highway tax, right? When you operate a truck, heavy truck every august you have to pay 550 bucks us to the us government because they give you the the right to drive your truck in the states 550 bucks every year and then as a canadian a couple of more things i had to do first off i needed a um i forgot to put it down uh, in order to cross the border between US and Canada, you have to pay a fee. And at first they would take that fee, it was like 10 bucks and it became 13 bucks US. At first they would take that fee right at the booth, you know, where you're at the border talking to, to <coughs> talking to the officer and they would ask you, do you have a transponder? You say no. So they would just give him, you give him your credit card, they charge you every time. Every time you have to pay, let's say the last one I paid, I think it was like 1350 US, right? But then they stopped doing that. They stopped taking payments at the booth and you had to go inside the building. You had to park your truck, go inside the building and make a payment. Uh, and you had to open a special account. There was like a special ATM machine, kind of like not ATM, but like special like a kiosk where you had to log into your account into your password and it would take like an hour. And so eventually everybody switched to transponder. So you need to have that transpond, kind of like a tall transponder. It's like a sticker with a, with a magnetic stripe inside. And that one was like 450 bucks US a year. So you need to have that in order to cross the border because they stopped, even though they still take those payments inside the building, but uh, I don't know, From they told me that I needed a transponder because they try to limit how many people want to go inside the building to pay that border crossing fee. Uh, and then of course there's tolls, right? Like most bridges between US and Canada are toll bridges. Uh, the broker doesn't have to do that, right? So uh, a lot of roads are toll roads, like here in, in, in uh, Toronto, Canada, right? Uh, I stopped going through Toronto because of the traffic. So I got a 407, you know, toll highway 407 transponder. And I was, if I was going from west to east or from east to west in my truck, in a semi-truck, 
I would always use the transponder when going around and that's very expensive for the truck it's like 100 bucks one one way I know if I do that like a couple of times a, a month then 407 sends me a bill for like $400 Canadian a month right it was very expensive like in Canada in the US it's not as bad but you know if you go somewhere east northeast US like uh, lots of roads are are uh, toll roads uh, and then what else we have here and then of course as a trucker you have to deal with permits right as a heavy haul trucker and that's what we're comparing here we're comparing a heavy haul trucker versus heavy haul broker like a freight broker that specializes in heavy haul so permits very expensive like especially when I had a tandem Jeep and booster and I'm 107 feet long I remember no BS from Toronto to Baltimore Maryland it cost me 3,000 US dollars in permits and escorts 3,000 and when you try to book a load a broker would say you know something that required that kind of setup with a tandem Jeep and booster the guy would say well we only have 6,000 in it and like and it's something like 105,000 pound excavator so I need the booster I need the Jeep right you need all these axles otherwise I won't get the permits and and okay it's 500 miles and the guy only wants to pay 6,000 I said well do you know how much permits cost or uh, no so brokers <laughs> brokers don't give a darn about permits you know so I said so you expect me to do this for three thousand dollars you know waste all this time you know and and that's actually that's why one, one of the reasons I want to stay in transportation because I know this I know this back 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 room story right I know the permits I know what kind of trailer you need for a load right so somebody called me hey can you can you give us a quote um what kind of machine um uh, i don't know typical answer the guy staying, is trying to ship something he has no idea what he's shipping uh, is it like a factory machine or is it like a generator or is it does it have wheels does it have tracks um i'm not sure i'll have to double check on that like how are you trying to find a truck you don't know what you're selling pretty much right okay well, what are the dimensions um we're not sure but okay what's the weight uh 200,000 pounds I said wait uh, my trailer is a 60 ton I cannot do 200,000 pounds okay hold on no yeah it's uh, 65,000 pounds no hold on uh, no sorry last number 90,000 pounds uh 18 feet wide um 16 feet tall um 57 feet long my next question when they tell me it's 57 feet long it's like okay how much do you need in the well and the broker would go uh what do you need 57 i said really so do you need 57 feet in the well uh what's a well <laughs> i said well if it's a tracked machine or wheeled machine the overall length yeah if you measure from the bucket let's say it's an excavator right you measure from the from the boom you know from the point where the boom falls and the bucket sits like this so you measure from the tip of that boom or arm to the rear it can be like 37 38 feet but you don't need 38 feet on the trailer because the tracks are only 14 16 feet long right but most brokers have no clue about this and and then of course you know like 16 wide 18 wide they have no idea that it would take like five pilots and two three months of preparation and then typical height right a guy would call me like 14 feet tall or 13 feet tall and going into northeast us and i'd say no like it can be done but it would take like half a year to line up all you know you have to talk to all the utility companies and so brokers like well, I thought you could just permit for height. Well, yeah, you can permit if you are in Oklahoma with no bridges, you know. But if you're going into Baltimore, New Jersey, you can permit, but it'll take a very, very, very long time. It'll cost a lot of money that I'm pretty sure the shipper, your shipper is not prepared to pay. 
and the ship is leaving let's say this goes to baltimore port the ship is leaving you know tuesday and today is friday <laughs> yeah we're trying to ship a 14 foot tall uh, excavator uh 13 feet wide uh 100 feet long a couple of times i said why are you calling me you should call the ra a railroad company or a boat shipping company what do you mean well i said it's 14 feet tall do you know how tall a regular trailer is like you know when the trailer sits on the ground what's the height of the deck do you know oh uh, i'll have to look into that <laughs> so the guy calls me right no like honestly that's what i had to deal with as a carrier like these i don't know who these guys are like some kind of kids right because they probably saw a video like this with the broker it's much cheaper to be a broker than a carrier but you gotta know your stuff right you have to learn like you cannot just jump from being a fast food you know worker flipping burgers to oh my friend said you can make good money as a broker but you gotta know this stuff you know and that's i'm thinking that will be or would be my strength if i become a broker because i know this right i'm coming from these from this side of the equation and so and so what the brokers don't understand quite often especially about height so he says okay the load is 14 feet i said okay you don't know how tall the trailer is i said okay typical trailer is somewhere close to two feet 24 inches right okay if you have a if it's a super light load you can get away with one of those fontaine 30 ton trailers they can be like they have a couple of models 12 inches tall and 14 inches tall but it's only for a light trailer right or you can get a mini deck mini deck for a heavy trailer but those are very heavy they're expensive you know it's like but they would sit like like this off the ground but still let's say a foot if you have that super specialized trailer and your and your load is 14 feet so now you're looking at 15 overall 15 overall I can tell you right now that in Ontario, for example, you cannot go on a freeway with 15, or being 15 foot tall. You cannot go on 401, you cannot go on 400, you cannot go on 407. You have to take county roads and you have to get a permit from each county. And how do I know that? Because once I tried to move, when I had my drop side rail, which where the loaded deck height was 13, uh, 13, six? Yeah, 13, six in theory, but it was more like 14, I would say. Uh, I tried to move a big caterpillar loader and I think it was like 13, six tall, the machine by itself. And so my overall was like 14, so 13.6, it was like 14.9, it was like, like 15 feet, and we couldn't do it. After like two weeks, we gave up because permits were taking too long, it was too expensive, and I just emailed the broker, I said, I'm sorry, I give up, I cannot move this, you need a beam trailer for this. And that's another thing, right? Freight brokers have no clue about different types of trailers. Again, we're talking about heavy haul, beam, mini deck, flat deck, extendable. Oh, so I need... I said, you know, you need this, you need a mini deck. Oh, a mini deck, that's what it's called. Or you need an extendable, you need a stretch trailer. Oh, stretch trailer, that's what they're called. Like, honestly, quite often brokers have no clue about equipment, right? And that's the end of my list. So uh, even if you were my tracking fan, so I hope this video gave you a little glimpse into the complicated business of trucking and the comparison between the trucker and the broker and that's why after 17 years behind the wheel i decided to quit trucking and seriously look into becoming a freight broker but i'm not there yet for now i'm on vacation uh, i'm in albert albert lee minnesota so i'm one day away from uh, my first park badlands national park i booked a hotel for three nights gonna spend three days there exploring badlands and the next park to the east custer and after that i'm going to yellowstone and then i'm gonna get to back to canada to alberta 
and that's when if I decide to do this I'll start taking some courses I'll start uh, uh, I'll start getting my authorities the bond stuff like that so that's it that's the early video for today thank you for watching be safe ciao